So our passage today is from Luke chapter 19, verses 11 to 38. And if you picked up one of these Bibles at the back, it's page 1052. So as we come to the end of our current series in Luke, we're about to see Jesus make a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, praised by many, but in the shadow of the cross. Let's read Luke chapter 19 from verse 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minuses. Put uh, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your miner has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of 10 cities. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put in my money on deposits so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his miner away from him and give it to one, the one who has 10 miners. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as they had told him. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the, gro- on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Thank you, Chris. This man is Paul Recessa Begina. He was the manager of a hotel in Rwanda's capital when the Rwandan genocide began in 1994. His story was popularised in the 2004 film Hotel Rwanda. For generations, the peace of Rwanda was threatened through the conflict of these two people groups, the Hutu and the Tutsi. Just before the genocide began, the Hutu and the Tutsi were beginning to negotiate peace talks. But things went pear-shaped when the Hutu president was killed, uh, shot down when his plane was attacked by a missile. And this sparked a revenge attack. 
The Hutu people were called to arms against their Tutsi friends, family, and neighbours. The genocide saw up to one million Tutsi people killed. Paul Recessa was a Hutu, but his wife was a Tutsi. He chose not to join the killings. Instead, when the killings began, he used his hotel as a shelter for refugees. He hid and protected over 1,000 refugees, and none of these were hurt or killed during the genocide. Paul wouldn't collude with this murderous regime. Instead of working with evil powers, he resisted. Instead of treating his wife's people cruelly, he was kind. He sought peace by rescuing victims. Today we hear a story about a ruthless king who uses his power to expand his oppressive regime and who kills those who threaten his peace. But we meet one brave citizen who refuses to cooperate. He won't collude with this evil system. He'll even call out the ruthless king on his evil ways. In Luke's gospel so far, we've been seeing what God's saying about God's kingdom. Jesus has been telling these stories that his kingdom is of love, of grace, of humility. A kingdom like a great feast where the poor and the blind and the lame and the travelling strangers are invited and welcomed in. A kingdom which is incredibly hard for the rich to enter, where it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for rich people to enter the kingdom of God because their love for money and status overpowers their love for God. A kingdom that you can only enter like a little child, fully dependent on Jesus' sacrifice to bring you in. But in our story today, Jesus doesn't say this is what the kingdom of God is like, because this parable is not showing us what God's kingdom is like. Matthew tells a similar story in chapter 25 of his gospel, which has the what the kingdom of God is like introduction. But Luke positions this parable in a different section of his book and includes different details, which makes us think it has a different significance than the parable in Matthew's gospel. But maybe something to keep thinking about in growth groups. In this parable, the ruthless king doesn't show us Jesus because this king is completely different to Jesus. This king rewards power-hungry behaviour. He commends shrewd money-making ventures. This king condemns humble righteousness. And this king kills peaceful opposition to him. It doesn't sound like Jesus at all. No, Jesus introduces this parable saying he's near Jerusalem, and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And then Jesus never stops to explain what the parable is about. We just move on straight into the next scene that Megan read for us, Jesus finally arriving in Jerusalem, and Jesus is heralded as the king coming to bring peace on earth. Because the arrival of God's kingdom comes as a threat to these human kingdoms, these other kingdoms that use power to keep the peace. So let me say right up front, Jesus' parable is all about exposing these human rulers, lifting up the veil to help us see these oppressive regimes, to help us see that Jesus is a very different sort of king. Because Jesus is the son of man who comes to seek and to save the lost. Remember this from last week. It's a title from the Old Testament book of Daniel, a title pregnant with anticipation and hope. The Son of Man brings God's kingdom which will last forever, a victory that triumphs over all enemies, a victory over evil kings, over beastly rulers, and brings peace for all people. Because at Jesus' birth, the angels announced the arrival of peace. But these are dangerous words when this guy's hanging around. Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, he's the one who'd brought peace to the whole empire. He's proclaimed as a saviour, as this ancient inscription says. 
a saviour who has made war to cease and will put everything in peaceful order. I think we can work out what that means. Pledge allegiance or you're done for. Because this is how murderous kings bring peaceful order. We've seen the same deadly power at work through King Herod, Caesar's puppet king. And Jesus has been criticising the Pharisees, these religious leaders, for teaming up with Herod, for colluding with these evil regimes in an attempt to get Jesus killed. And of course, behind these evil human powers, there's a sinister demonic power at work. It's the work of Satan. But when the Son of Man brings the kingdom that lasts forever in his death and resurrection, the power of all these beastly rulers will be taken away. So the kingdom of God is coming, like the people thought, very soon. But the kingdom of God will look totally different to what they expect. And the worldly kingdoms will still exist while God's kingdom reigns over them. So the story confronts us with a decision. Which kingdom will have your allegiance? Will it be the kingdom of God, where grace and love rule, where everyone is welcome, who depends on Jesus' sacrifice like a little child? Or the kingdoms of this world with beastly rulers, where people are hungry for money and power, and the lies of the evil one are behind them all. And now Jesus' parable introduces us to another cruel leader. See, Jesus tells this story about a nobleman who goes to a distant country to be appointed as king. But he's so hated by the people that they send a delegation after him to protest. They're saying, we don't want him as our king. And in the end, he slaughters his enemies. He says, kill them in front of me. What kind of a king is this? It's actually based on a true story of a guy called Archelaus. Here he is. His father was the king, and when his father died, Archelaus went to Rome to receive the kingdom. But just like in Jesus' parable, the people hated him. They sent a delegation after him to protest his claim of the throne. Because Archelaus was a cruel and ruthless man. One day, he ordered the massacre of 3,000 people, Jews who were worshipping at the temple. You see, this is a king who slaughters his enemies. So as Jesus tells this parable about a cruel king, it's not hard to imagine what's going on in the people's minds. They're saying, yes, Jesus, we know exactly what you're talking about. We remember the times of Archelaus. But this isn't just some random story plucked from Israel's grisly history. It's possible the disciples were already reminded of the story because they were in Jericho. We read at the beginning of chapter 19 that Jesus had entered Jericho, was passing through on his way to Jerusalem. And Jericho was where Archelaus lived. When he became ruler, he rebuilt his father's palace in Jericho. Those buildings were still standing in Jesus' day. This is what they probably looked like. A grand, extravagant palace on both sides of that gorge. A palace decked out with Roman decorations and probably built by a team of Roman builders. So the disciples are on this road climbing up from Jericho to Jerusalem. Can you imagine what it would have been like? You're going up to Jerusalem and as you climb you glimpse these palaces, these grand monuments to the power of Archelaus but also the power of Rome behind him. And as the grisly history of Archelaus comes to mind, you're here with Jesus, you're here with the king. He's about to enter the holy city. Here's Jesus coming to bring the kingdom of God and put an end to these beastly rulers, rulers like Caesar and Herod and the Pharisees. And yes, like Archelaus too. Jesus is exposing these human kingdoms, which is why this story is so frightening. It hits so close to home that people remember the times of Archelaus. They know what Jesus is talking about. And the king in this parable is not just politically ambitious. He's money hungry as well. He gives his money to his servants while he's away. And the master expects big profits 
to fill his fat wallet. When the master returns, the first two servants have earned big bucks. One mina has become ten. The other mina has become five. It's a massive profit. So how did they get that money? Because these are big profits. They're not just doubling what they've got. It's not just money from a high interest account at a bank. These guys are probably money lenders. Because how else would they be able to get to multiply these money, this money so much? They make profits from high interest loans. And when people can't cough up the repayments, they take their land. It's a cruel system that guarantees the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And the master rewards the cruelty of these two servants. He commends what they've done with their money. The master gives the two servants more power. So now they're not just part of cruel systems. Now they're in control of these systems. Now they're the ones that are going to make sure the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. But then we meet this third servant. He's not hungry for power. He won't buy into this oppressive system. So he refuses to cooperate in exploiting others. He resists the rule of the cruel master. He keeps the money safe, then returns it to him. Because this is the honourable thing to do. Jewish law forbade lending money with interest. But this cruel master calls him evil, calls him a wicked servant. So the master gives the money to the other servant, the one who paid, got all the big bucks. So this evil king is a beastly ruler. He rewards the power-hungry servants. He condemns the good servant. And then he gloats. He says, to everyone who has, more will be given. To those who do not have, even what they have will be taken away. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. These words from this cruel master, they sound similar to words that Jesus said. When Jesus was warning the Pharisees back in Luke chapter 8, but Jesus starts this, or what he's saying, by saying, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, who doesn't have, even what they have, will be taken away. These were wise words from Jesus, warning the Pharisees there's a judgment coming. But on the lips of this cruel king, these words become twisted wisdom. They show us the horror of wicked men wreaking vengeance on others, who justify their evil as wisdom. But this servant will have no part of it. He resists the pressure to collude, to work with these evil regimes. Just like Paul Recessa Begona, he wouldn't be influenced and he refused to join his people, the Hutus, who were slaughtering the Tutsi. So Jesus' parable exposes these human kingdoms with beastly rulers, where everyone is hungry for power and money and the lies of the evil one are behind them all. For Jesus came as a good, loving king. Instead of being a beastly ruler, he ruled with grace. Instead of exerting power like an evil king, Jesus lays down his power at the cross. Because Jesus has come to bring peace, to bring the peace of heaven here to earth. But Jesus doesn't win peace through power, he doesn't triumph over his enemies by destroying them. Instead, Jesus dies for them. He dies for his enemies. Enemies that included the crowd who shouted for Jesus to be crucified. We'll see this soon when Jesus goes to, into Jerusalem. The people who used to follow him are now the people who work with the evil leaders to put him to death. Sinners like us, because the sinners, we are part of these sinful kingdoms. When we sin, we engage with the destructive ways of this world. We believe the lies of the evil one. We collude with the evil one as part of the crowd that condemns Jesus to death. But Jesus dies for sinners, dies for his enemies. 
to make his enemies his friends, to make his friends his brothers and sisters, children of God. This is Jesus' victory over the evil powers that rule this world. This is Jesus as the Son of Man bringing his kingdom that lasts forever. He defeats death. He takes away our sin. He defeats this demonic power so that we can enter his reign of peace. He rescues us from the dominion of darkness. He forgives our sin. He forgives my sin, your sin. Have you been rescued from darkness into Jesus' kingdom? Have you received forgiveness? Have you let Jesus change the allegiance of your heart? Because this is the power of God's kingdom. When God captures the allegiance of your heart, you've joined a kingdom that's unstoppable. Because the same power that brought life from death, that's the power of God at work in us. Resurrection life by God's spirit. And maybe this is the challenge for us. Because we tend to forget that it's God's power at work within us. It's God's power over death. God's power over sin. God's power to bring his kingdom, the power to change and grow as a disciple, it's God's power within you to change the allegiances of your heart. And we saw an example of this last week of someone who colluded with evil powers, met Jesus and his allegiance changed. This fellow named Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, but also a chief tax collector, And tax collectors worked as agents of Rome. They worked with an oppressive system, exploiting people with high taxes. But Zacchaeus meets Jesus, and suddenly his life takes a radical turn. He vows to repay the dirty money. Instead of confessing Caesar as Lord, he says that Jesus is Lord. He's an agent of Rome who changes allegiances, who separates himself from the oppressive regime. Once an agent of Rome, now a servant of God. And like Zacchaeus, we need to choose. Do we continue in the seductive ways of this world and ignore what Jesus has done for us? Or do we separate ourselves from the destructive ways of this world because of what Jesus has done? This is what the third servant did. He continued to serve in his master's kingdom, but he worked differently to the other servants, not in the destructive ways of sinful kingdoms, but in the honourable ways of God's kingdom. Separation from sinful kingdoms doesn't mean disconnecting like those who want to get out of the world or the temptation to stay within our Christian bubble and not step out of it. Separation from sinful kingdoms is about staying connected, being in the world but not of the world, being an ambassador for God's kingdom within the kingdoms of this world. Because even though Jesus' death takes away the power of sinful kingdoms and through faith our allegiance is changed, we must be careful of the influence of these worldly kingdoms. Because the influence of our age isn't violently coercive, not like Rome, not like the evil human regimes that led to the Rwandan genocide. No, the power of our culture isn't coercion, but compulsion. It's soft power. You could say it's the power of words, the power of storytelling to influence and persuade us. And we love stories. We love bedtime stories. Yarns over the fence, stories about our lives. It's not a bunch of facts to get to our head, but a story that woos our hearts. Because stories have the power to orient our hearts. It's one of the reasons we love reading the Bible. It's one of the reasons why we use Jesus' stories to tell people about Jesus. But the evil kingdoms of this world use stories too. Stories told in ads and movies and songs and books and TV, maybe even political campaigns. Stories that draw us in. Stories that have some good in them, but they ultimately present a vision for the good life without God. 
Often the stories of this world echo the lies of the serpent. It's a subtle power, it's soft power. Where stories about bravery and family and survival also encourage us to think differently about sex and violence and power. How might that be orienting our hearts? What influence is it having on you? But also where stories about beauty and creativity and order also encourage us to find contentment in comparison and material things. How might that be orienting our hearts? How might it be influencing you? Is it wise to keep consuming these things? We need to think about it and make a decision. And the truth is, I'm always telling myself stories, encouraged by the stories of this world, but also my own selfishness. Stories about the kind of life I want. Stories about who I am. If I'm honest with myself, and if I'm paying attention, these are the sorts of stories I tell myself. And there's a power in those words. And if we are to be ambassadors for God's kingdom in a world of evil kingdoms, how can we engage with the stories of this world without being influenced by them? How do we live out our story given to us in Jesus with confidence and courage? So this is a challenge because the good news of Jesus comes to us in words. It comes to us as the true story of God our world and ourselves. It's often called the greatest story ever told. And Jesus was always telling stories. It's why he tells this parable, because stories have the power to orient our hearts. So here's the challenge. Are you aware of the stories you're telling yourself? Will you guard your heart with God's story? Can you spot the false narratives that sneak in and replace those stories with the true story. This is something we're going to look at next term with our new series, Living a Better Story. So Jesus told this parable to expose the kingdoms of this world with beastly rulers and the lies of the evil one behind them all, knowing that in his death and resurrection, the kingdom of God will come, where grace and love rule. And there is forgiveness for those who once colluded with evil powers. So separate yourself from the evil ways of this world, like Paul Recessa Begina did. Work differently within the systems of this world, like the third servant did. And be an ambassador for God's kingdom in a world of evil kingdoms, guarding your heart with the story of Jesus, engaging with the stories of this world but not letting them influence you. Because in Jesus, we have a better story. It's a true story in the name of Jesus. It's the true story we tell, the true story we live, and the true story we share together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are a good king. You're all-powerful and almighty. You reign over all other powers. You rule with love and grace. Thank you for rescuing us from the dominion of darkness into your kingdom. Lord, continue to change the allegiance of our hearts by the direction of your spirit. Help us to separate ourselves from the ways of the world. May we guard our hearts against the lies of the evil one with your promises strong and true. May we stand courageously as ambassadors for your peaceful kingdom within the chaos of our world. We pray these things for your glory, Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your spirit working within us. Amen.